Welcome back, everyone. I know we've all been looking forward to hearing from Gunnar Esiason. Gunnar is a cystic fibrosis and rare disease patient leader who's passionate about early stage drug development, patient empowerment, and health policy. He holds an MBA from the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth and is now working towards a master's of public health at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. He has consulted on clinical trial development, health studies, as well as CF specific mental health and wellness screening tool. His health policy opinions have been featured in the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, The Hill, Stat News, and other news sources. Today, he will present My Life with Cystic Fibrosis, Our Unlocked Futures, and Breaking Down Barriers for the Continued Success of the CF Community. Gunnar, welcome. Thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks to everyone at CFRI and, of course, Siri for, for having me. So I'm going to uh, jump on here and uh, share my screen so we can get going. Um, so, yeah, my, uh, my talk today is titled My Life with Cystic Fibrosis, Our Unlocked Futures, and Breaking Down Barriers for the, C uh, for the Continued Success of the CF Community. Uh, I will admit that I think when I chose that title, it was a little long, uh, but here we are, uh, and I uh, appreciate uh, everyone calling in uh, to sit with me for a few minutes this afternoon. So what we're gonna talk about first is, you know, who I am uh, and I'll go through some uh, of my more influential encounters with the medical system. Uh, and I had this whole talk planned out, but then of course, uh, my wife Darcy and I uh, were now pregnant and expecting a baby boy uh, the end of uh, this year. So I will save the last uh, five, 10 minutes to talk about the IVF process and everything that we went through to get to this point where, uh, where we are today. But uh, first, I want to start about, uh, you know, who I am, what do I do, where do I come from? Uh, of course, the Boomer Science and Foundation is a huge part of my life. Uh, it was founded in 1993 when I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. Uh, my mom and dad founded the organization, and to date, we are approaching uh, a total of $200 million raised in the fight against cystic fibrosis. Uh, and of course, a lot of our, uh, our funding and resources and efforts goes towards uh, therapeutics and research options for, uh, for, uh, for different clinicians and investigators. Uh, to better understand cystic fibrosis. Uh, but most importantly, and I think the thing that I'm most proud about uh, is our financial assistance that we are uh, affording to the CF community. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I'm also a board member at No Patient Left Behind, uh, where we talk about uh, access to breakthrough medications uh, for people with rare uh, diseases, rare cancers, uh, and of course, among the broader healthcare uh, industry. And then uh, as Jim mentioned, I am uh, presently a graduate student. I just finished my MBA uh, this past spring at Tuck and uh, will be finishing my MPH uh, at Dartmouth uh, this coming year. But I wanna leave this uh, slide here for a second so that anyone on the call who uh, you know, may find themselves in a position to uh, use one of our financial assistance programs to go ahead and do so. Again, that's www.assiason.org and then navigate to financial uh, assistance. We offer scholarships for people who are going through uh, undergrad and then of course, graduate students as well. Uh, we have a new, a new program, uh, COVID-19 Economic Relief uh, for folks who have fallen on hard times because of the pandemic over the last year and a half. Uh, we also offer transplant assistance grants for folks who are going through uh, the transplant process in cystic fibrosis, uh, whether that's lung uh, or other solid organ transplants. And those uh, cover costs that are not generally touched by insurance coverage. So I'm talking, you know, re uh, uh, travel expenses and, and anything associated with uh, the transplant process that a, a typical cystic fibrosis patient would go through. And then, of course, something that we're, uh, we are proud of as well and something that is relatively new for, for the foundation is our disaster relief uh, fund for folks who are victims of natural disasters across the United States. So I want to start uh, by uh, talking about my early days with cystic fibrosis. And really, when I uh, crossed the threshold into understanding that I had the disease, of course, my dad uh, was playing in the NFL when I was diagnosed and um, after a call with Frank DeFord, who uh, <clears throat> was a very famous sports writer um, in the 80s, 90s, and then 2000s, uh, his, his daughter Alex unfortunately passed away from cystic fibrosis many decades ago. But right after I was diagnosed, he called my dad and said, you know, we have an opportunity now to put a face on cystic fibrosis. Uh, and it wasn't my choice to be thrown to the spot, but uh, there I was in 1993 on top of my dad's shoulders uh, uh, in, uh, on the cover of Sports Illustrated. But that, of course, wasn't really when, my, when I... Uh, you know, understood that I had cystic fibrosis, nor did I really know what CF was. And I think most people living with the condition probably recognize there's one influential moment where we realize that, you know what, we might actually be a little different than everyone else. 
Uh, and for me, that was when I was in first grade. I was still receiving care at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, and early one morning, my parents came to my room and they woke me up. They said, Gunnar, we're going, we're going to Cincinnati Children's. We got to go see the doctor. And of course, this was a little different than most other uh, visits. I could tell right away. I had never been woken up so early to go to the clinic. But there we were uh, on the way to Cincinnati Children's Hospital, the 15 or 20 minute journey. And about halfway through, my dad, sitting in the front seat, driving the car, turned around, looked at me and said, Gunnar, this isn't going to hurt. So I could immediately tell that something was different. I could tell that my parents were nervous. And now by extension, I was nervous because when my dad told me that something wasn't going to hurt, uh, of course, I had no desire to believe him. Uh, but there we were. We, we finally got to the hospital. And instead of going left to the to cystic fibrosis clinic that I was so familiar with at such a young age, we went to interventional radiology. And I was about to uh, have my first experience with, a, with an IV antibiotics, a PICC line. Uh, and uh, my parents neglected to tell me that that was going to happen to me. So uh, we walk into the interventional radiology unit. They, of course, you know, stripped me down. They put me into uh, one of those fashionable medical gowns that we're all too familiar with. Uh, and uh, an anesthesiologist walked in, could immediately tell that I was uh, a little distraught, uh, nervous, and fear was not too far from where I was standing. Uh, and uh, she came in and not so much speaking to me, but to my parents as well, who were also in the room with me while we were waiting. And so, you know, let's, let's give Gunnar some, something to take the edge off a little bit and prescribed liquid Versed for me to drink. And uh, for those of you who have ever taken Versed, you know exactly what it is and why it's a pretty chill medication to take. But the good first reader that I was had no desire to ever uh, drink a medication, let alone uh, a new medication early in the morning uh, while I was uh, definitely on, uh, on, on, the, on the verge of a complete panic attack. So over the next 30, 25 to 30 minutes, a rotating cast of characters walked into our hospital room to uh, try to convince me to drink the medication to, to calm me down and to take the edge off. Uh, but I said no. I kept saying no. I said no to this, this nurse, that nurse, the, this anesthesiologist, this doctor, that doctor, until finally the anesthesiologist walked back into the room and said, you know what, we have to get Gunner to calm down. This procedure is really going to hurt him. He's going to be super uncomfortable. We can't have him squirming around on the table. We might have to put him out for this procedure. And the moment I heard that, I was sitting in my dad's lap. I jumped off. I looked at him square in the eye and I said, you lied to me, said this wasn't going to hurt. She said it's going to hurt. Who do I believe? I don't have time for this. And I just ran away out the door, through the hallway, through the open area, uh, the lobby area of the hospital, because now it's a few hours later, you know, of course, since we first got there uh, after all the waiting. And then, of course, this the circus with the Versed that now it's packed. So we're in Cincinnati. My dad is finishing his career in the final year of his career playing for the Cincinnati Bengals. Starting quarterback in the Cincinnati Bengals is chasing his belligerent son through the lobby, through crowds of people, through you know, different, uh, different, different parts of the hospital. until finally, I find myself in a dead end corner where there's a handicap railing on the wall. And I grab onto this handicap railing. My dad describes it as the Vulcan death grip onto this, this handicap railing until he finally catches up to me. I'm, I'm crying and screaming. He's trying to pull me off. He's like, Gunnar, you're making a scene. Please calm down. This isn't, this is crazy. Like we gotta go back in there. You're making us look bad. There, there's so much going on here and I will do whatever you want if you go back into that room with me. And the moment he said that, I think that's the time I realized that I wanted to be an MBA, but I also felt that I had the leverage in the situation to make a deal with him. So of course we made, we made a deal that ended up uh, turning out to be a new video game. Uh, so not only did I uh, come out of this as the most popular first grader in class, uh, I did reluctantly agree to go back into the uh, interventional radiology suite with him where I subjected myself to my first ever pick line. And of course, uh, two weeks of antibiotics as we all know too well. Uh, and really the reason I tell this story is because it was my first impact with my, my sorry, my first, uh, in, you know, my first interaction with what I call medical trauma. It was, uh, the kind of thing that shaped the way that I saw the health system from an early age to the point where anytime I was going back for a blood draw, a flu shot, even a blood pressure, uh, you know, test where they put the cuff on your arm, I was completely terrified completely terrified of every single thing that happened to me inside a medical center because I had this one terrible, terrible experience. So, you know, I, from there, I, I sort of, you grow up and I, I lived, I think what I would consider a pretty typical childhood. I, I didn't uh, have too many uh, run-ins with, uh, with uh, my CF or declining disease 
uh, declining health rather as I uh, as I grew up and went through middle school and uh, until I got to high school. And when I got to high school, I sort of understood the value of a team because I played football. I um, my at the beginning of my freshman year, uh, I saw that my my high school had a small football team. It wasn't a good football team, let me tell you that. Um, but I wanted to play because I wanted to be. Uh, you know, someone I could you know, follow in my dad's footsteps. When I, you know, grown up around the game, I just wanted to do that more than anything else as a child. You know, you can imagine Sunday afternoons in my household, where in my house is, as many households are just consumed by NFL games. And I grew up loving the game of football. And by the time I got to high school, I, I wanted to play tackle football. And of course, I uh, when I when I when I signed up, my parents weren't too pleased. I uh, I, I, I came home one night and I said, you know, dad, I love to play football. What do you think? Will you sign me up? And he said, you have to ask your mother. And then I went over to my mom and I said, mom, dad said I can play football. Can you please sign on the dotted line? And away we went. But things weren't all that great uh, for me during my, uh, my early days, uh, especially um, as I jumped on the team. You know, I think my first day of practice was drop everything, run a mile and just keep working out, keep working out, keep working out. And I quickly realized that I was on a definitely a, uh, a different athletic level than most of my friends. You know, as we progressed through high school, while my friends were getting stronger, I was not to keep it simple. You know, I, I had a hard time keeping my weight on, I had a hard time putting on muscle mass, but I struggled through, I made it through and I uh, completed two, uh, two seasons of my, uh, my JV football career, my freshman and sophomore year of high school and had a lot of fun doing it. But by, by the time I made the, the varsity team my, my junior year as the backup quarterback, you know, I think I realized that I was a different level until one day I was actually thrown into a game. Uh, and I was, I kind of convinced myself that, yeah, you know what, I think I can do this if I, uh, if I keep, uh, keep working hard uh, with, with, uh, with my conditioning and training. So between my junior and senior year of high school, you know, I sort of had this feeling that, okay, you know what, I can do this. I'll, I will come back. I plan to be the starting quarterback my senior year of high school. That's what I want to do. That's my goal. And then I was struck by mono. And mono for me was probably the first time in my life when I went to my CF clinic and I continued to see over and over and over again that my PFTs were just trending down and they were not coming back up regardless of whatever we did. So for that, in, you know, the second half of that summer from you know, July onwards, uh, I was just completely uh, just devastated to see that my health was starting to get into the rest of my life. And to really um, overwhelm every other, uh, you know, every other goal that I sort of had that summer, you know, I'm starting to think about going to college and starting to think about, you know, other parts of life. And for me, it was, it was tough because, you know, CF was just all consuming, but like the stubborn 17 year old kid that I was, I felt like I could still play football. I could still do it. So when training camp rolled around, uh, at the end of August, I uh, showed up like I did any other um, any any other season and put myself through it. But as I had uh, earlier in my career, started to understand that I was on a different athletic playing field. It was most pronounced when I was about to enter a senior uh, about to enter my senior year of high school during that that early season uh, training and practice program. You know, I had been a shell of my former self. I had lost weight all summer, and I just I just could not get get going. Until one day uh, during training camp, we uh, were doing conditioning and you know, like the stubborn kid that I was, I put myself through it in a hot August day. Uh, and then about halfway through a training session uh, during sprints, I, you know, we were, we were told to drop down and do uh, push-ups, which of course dropped down and did. And about halfway through my set of push-ups, I collapsed. I found myself uh, face first in the field, kind of rolled myself over eventually. And I looked up and I saw about 10 or 15 of my friends huddled around me as if they had all just seen a ghost. And what they were really looking at was me covered in blood because I looked down and my shirt was just drenched in, in this, this God awful shade of red that I had never really seen before. And it was the first time I had a massive hemoptysis and it happened to me at 17 years old in the middle of uh, a football field on Long Island where uh, surrounded by my friends. And it was a little uh, intimidating to say the least but um, in, in a way to shake off, I guess, the embarrassment that I had, I tried to just pop myself up and I look over and I see the coach is running for me. The training staff is running for me. You know, all of a sudden, um, everyone who knew that I was a high risk person to be there, uh, all, you know, all their, their worst nightmares were sort of coming to fruition. 
Uh, and, you know, I was kind of just helped over to the sideline. And I just said, you know what, we just got to call my mom. We call my mom. She will know what to do. Please just, you know, don't, don't freak out. Don't panic. I can breathe. I'm okay. You know, I know this looks bad and, you know, I'm kind of making this up as I go, you know, because I, I had never really happened to me, but I, I knew that if I could breathe, I, was, I, I would be okay. Um, until finally we got, we got a hold of my mom and, um, we also got a hold of the cystic fibrosis center. So my mom picked me up from, from practice and we drove right into uh, the CF center at Columbia, where I had probably the most difficult conversation with a physician up to that point in my life. And the way it went was, you know, we walked in, we saw that my PFTs were, were going down again. So it's, you know, now going on a third month of, uh, of, of tough PFT scores, of tough clinic visits, of tough uh, encounters uh, since my mono set in. Um, and finally, I was presented with a choice by my doctor. My doctor said, you know, Gunnar, we can probably get you through this football season if you, if you really want to. We can, we can give you this, this option, but I don't think you can finish this season. I think you have to give up your football career. I think this is the end um, because we have to start treating this issue seriously. And I was gutted. I was just absolutely devastated that in the matter of two minutes, a conversation took away everything that I had worked for in my entire life. And, and especially during my years in high school, I was forced to confront with the, with the idea and the reality that I was not going to be a starting quarterback for my high school football team. What it also did is it showed me that my cystic fibrosis was not going away. It was with me for uh, the, the thick and thin, the good times, and the bad, and this was, an exceptionally bad time for me to be uh, confronted with this reality. So the doctor said, you know, I'll give you this choice. Uh, go home and talk it over with your parents and then call me, uh, you know, call me, call the clinic in the morning and we'll, we'll get something going. We'll, we'll start, we'll, we'll move the, the gears uh, towards um, hopefully trying to treat what, whatever we can. So the entire car ride home, I'm, I'm on the verge of tears. My mom calls my dad and, you know, alerts him to, how the, the visit went and the conversation that, you know, he's going to have to have with me when we get home. Because I think from, from my mom's perspective, she was worried about letting my health uh, get even worse. You know, I think, you know, any CF parent on the call here knows that watching your child struggle with CF is it's not an easy thing. And uh, oftentimes when my, when my parents had to, to deal with it, you know, they, they definitely masked it very well. They didn't show fear to me or anything like that. But I think this was a time in our lives where, you know, we were all confronting this, this new reality that we were living in. So we do get home. Uh, my mom had prepped with my dad for, for the chat. And there we are uh, sort of sitting in like at the study of our, of our house or whatever you want to call it. And uh, he said, Gunnar, you know, I, I, I heard about the, the doctor's appointment. And I think um, there's something I need to tell you, something that's been weighing on my chest for me for far too long, but I have to tell it to you. And I said, what, what's that, Dad? And he said, well, Gunnar, you are like the worst football player I've ever seen in my entire life. And with that, I think I was just so shocked, just so absolutely shocked that, that was the way the conversation had gone right off the bat that I didn't know what to say. I didn't know whether to laugh. I didn't know whether to cry. I didn't know whether to be crushed. But what he was really saying and what would go on to say is that we have no other option here. We have to treat your CF as aggressively as we can because you have other things in life to think about. You have a hockey season coming up in the winter, and then you also want to go off to college. Like those are two major things that you want in your life. And those are things that we will, you know, try to get you to, but we can't get to those without addressing this challenge that, that is confronting you. So you can imagine how this day went. It went from the worst possible moment for me at practice to an even more difficult chat with my, my doctor and my mom at, at the clinic to all of a sudden my dad's telling me, no, 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 no. This is just one challenge on the, on the way to the rest of your life. Of course, there's going to be other challenges along the way, but we have to deal with this one right here and right now. And that's, that's really what we did. The next morning we called the center. We said the decision has been made. We had to start treatment right away. And lo and behold, I had my first ever bronchoscopy uh, about a week later and then started weeks and weeks of IV antibiotics to treat the infection that was uh, exacerbated by the mononucleosis until Finally, I stabilized and I was healthy enough to compete uh, in my hockey with my hockey team that season, uh, my senior year season, and then of course, head off to college. So I went to Boston College and of course, uh, you know, after uh, a life of CF, you sort of are banged up a little bit. Um, I certainly was, especially after those last few years. Uh, but when I got to school, I learned more about, you know, who I was and what I was able to do with my life. 
than I think I probably had been prepared to do uh, at any other point in, uh, in, in my sort of, you know, grow, you know my, my state, my, my childhood or grown up. Um, but the health challenges continued, right? That, that mononucleosis that I had between my junior and senior year of high school sort of set me on a path of uh, aggressive, aggressive illness for the next five or so years. Um, you know, maybe even, you know, seven or eight years as well. So, um, from about the age of 17 years old to, you know, 26, 27 years old, I was going through one health challenge after the next. And, um, the next sort of big one, the big, the big moment in my life, the sort of big health moment in my life, at least was, uh, during my sophomore year of college, I like had some crazy virus, uh, talk about crazy viruses. Uh, I had a crazy virus, probably my, my first semester of that year, which actually sent me home to New York today. I, I was hospitalized. I was uh, treated with another round of antibiotics to sort of support the uh, body's re immune response, fighting the virus, but also uh, so that I could uh, treat the pseudomonas that was living in my lungs. Um, I was discharged from the hospital and then uh, a few days later, something pancreatitis. So no one really knows how that pancreatitis sort of came on. And if you've never dealt with it, uh, good, I'm happy for you. I hope you never have to, but it is a uh, somewhat of a, uh, I guess, a moderately rare complication that can happen to people with cystic fibrosis. It's just incredibly painful. Uh, and the way that uh, it's treated is I had to fast. I had to starve myself. Uh, so there I was back in the hospital uh, a week later, uh, and I was uh, fasting. As a, as a treatment for my pancreatitis. So over the course of the next week, I just started losing weight uh, until I finally uh, sort of overcame my, my bout with pancreatitis. And uh, when I left the hospital, I was weighing in at less than 130 pounds. So I'm, I'm six foot two. Uh, I was essentially skin and bones when I uh, left the hospital uh, sort of uh, that, that fall of my sophomore year. And on the way out, you know, it was sort of, it sort of dawned upon, I think all of us, that a feeding tube was in my future. And that was the only way forward was that we had to go with a feeding tube. And like the stubborn kid that I was, my dad will tell you that uh, I resisted my feeding tube uh, for many, many years. Um, but I think that uh, that healthcare was so pronounced that it, there was just no looking back from it. I will say, however, uh, my doctor in Boston at the time uh, who had heard about uh, the conversation, my, my hospitalization, called me uh, when I returned to when I returned to BC a few weeks later and said, you know, I, I want to tell you the story of, uh, of a woman who was one of my patients many years ago, and her goal was to run the Boston Marathon. She wanted to run the Boston Marathon, but she kept hurting herself during, uh, during training because she had every classic CF malnutrition uh, symptom. You know, she just wasn't putting on weight. She wasn't putting on muscle mass. And she came to me one day and said, you know, doc, I really have this goal, but my CF is getting in the way of running the Boston Marathon. Is there anything that we can do to give me even just a little bit more strength so that I can do this? And he said, yeah, why don't we try a feeding tube? And lo and behold, she did it. She was so motivated and so driven to finish the Boston Marathon that he, they, she was able to do it with a feeding tube. And she you know, put on a couple of pounds, was able to keep on some muscle and completed the marathon. And the doctor telling me the story was, you know, someone that knew that I was an athletic person, he knew what would motivate me, what would drive me to, uh, to overcome my fear of this feeding tube, the fear that I had. And looking back, I had no idea why I had this fear, but I did. Uh, and I was convinced, right? This was a conversation that I still think about quite frequently when I'm going through a frustrating, rough time, uh, because this doctor knew exactly what I needed to hear, right? He knew that I was, a feeding tube was in my future, whether I wanted it or not. But he knew that I would be more accepting of it if I could convince myself that I did, in fact, need it. And he did. He did a great job of talking to me and meeting me as a human being and talking about things outside my CF, right? He knew that I wanted to get back to playing hockey and real hockey at BC. I wanted to stop missing school. I wanted to be on campus as much as I could with my buddies. And he told me the story about uh, one of his patients. And I think it was uh, something that I uh, have a great deal of respect for. Right, because I think there's sometimes a hesitancy to compare patients and CF, and I'm not sure. I'm not saying it's a good thing to do all the time, but he took the chance and he took the risk to do it, and and uh, I'm glad he did because I think that uh, it saved my life. Right, when I was about 21, 22 years old, I was just completely, completely um, 
malnourished at that point in my life. And very quickly, I put on a ton of weight. Uh, I'm the kind of person who uh, I'm a picky eater to begin with. And I just, you know, have always had a hard time uh, keeping food down. But the feeding tube definitely did that for me uh, early, early in my life. But it really was only getting me to a point where I could be healthy enough to kind of just survive. Right. So I had to get through the next few years of college, which to me sort of felt like a bit of a marathon in and of itself, because by the time I graduated, I was uh, in a downward spiral that I just could not get myself out of. So um, graduated the spring of 2013 and about every every other month from that point on, I was either dealing with a new uh, exacerbation, a new pulmonary uh, pulmonary issue, and I was just a frequent flyer at uh, the Cystic Fibrosis Clinic at, at Columbia because I just could not get on top of whatever it was that was um, that was keeping me down. I, uh, I Between 2013 and 2018, I think I went through about two dozen medical interventions to deal with my you know, rapidly evolving uh, pseudomonas infection and my uh, rapidly progressing cystic fibrosis. It got to the point where, you know, what does my life look like when I am, you know, struggling from one month to the next, right? I was lucky if I had a good month and a half in there. It was a really, really brutal existence. And with every trip to the clinic, you know, you see that PFP number slipping further and further and further down. And that is just gutting, right? You see your PFP number sliding, you know, those, those numbers are not coming back. And that's exactly how I felt. When I was 22, 23, 24 years old, I saw my friends moving on to different jobs, to, you know, having great social lives, to, I was living with my parents and I was lucky if I could, uh, you know, strap, you know, string together a couple good weeks in a row. So what I did to sort of keep myself healthy was I actually went back to coaching. I coached high school football. I coached high school ice hockey. And I credit those things with keeping me on my feet and keeping me with something that I wanted to do, right? I had a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Uh, until one day, my doctor approached me with a clinical trial opportunity, um, and this was back in twenty, in the end of twenty thirteen, beginning of twenty fourteen. Said, you know, there's there's a, there's a drug trial going on. We'd love to get you involved. Uh, you know, we'll give you something to do. You meet the inclusion criteria, and that was the first uh, time I'd ever done a, uh, a randomized controlled clinical trial. And for me, it was a mind-blowing experience to be a part of science, to be a part of something bigger than myself. It gave me purpose. And to this day, I say that people living with rare, rare diseases have the ability to control the prognosis of their own condition through their willingness to participate in research. And I'm not just talking about like the sexy CFTR rescue, you know, studies. I'm talking about everything else, right? Every other part of um, cystic fibrosis study and every other part of cystic fibrosis um, care and science is in some way or another reliant on the patient to push forward, right? That is the thing that we all have to do to make sure that our disease moves forward uh, for, for, uh, for our clinicians to better treat us. And I think that uh, as, a, as a 23, you know, 22, 23 year old, when I first enrolled into a trial, it was, of course it didn't work back then, but I still felt like I did something, right? I, I, I provided the, the no or the failure, right? I provided that answer so that we could move on to the next thing. Then I enrolled in another clinical trial, which also failed, but that was another no, that was another step in the right direction to hopefully finding something that would maybe not only work for myself, but everyone else too. And I think that, um, you know, being in a clinical trial is a very interesting experience because uh, it's, you know, it, it feels like you're actively doing something, but it's also not super difficult to do. And uh, I, I do uh, give my doctor a lot of credit for, uh, for, you know, asking me to be in one. And now these days, whenever I get asked, I just say yes, like it's a very easy thing for me to do. Um, so it, it wasn't until, uh, of course, the 2018 when I was in the TriCAFTA program that things really started to turn around for me. But I do wanna pause quickly and talk about a few trial opportunities or a few research opportunities that might be out there that you may not have heard of. Um, one is the HERO2 study that's being uh, done by, the in by Indiana University. That one's really cool because it's uh, home reported, right? It's all about you uh, entering your, your information into uh, an app to see how you're doing. Uh, you can go to hero2study.com to look at that. 
Then I've got two mental health trials on here, one for adults and one for teens. Uh, the contact information is there as well. I think that one's cool because I think uh, mental health is an under, you know, an under sort of appreciated part of living with cystic fibrosis. Uh, you know, I think it's part of this, you know, I think it's something that was probably overlooked while we were sort of driving for a uh, therapeutic change. So I'm excited uh, that mental health is now uh, in the forefront for, for people with CF. Uh, and there is uh, something that I uh, definitely uh, am taking an interest in and, and contact information for you is there as well. And then, of course, I think uh, Dr. Koff and Dr. Chan from Yale were talking uh, on a conference either yesterday or the day before uh, about the things they're dealing with uh, phages at Yale. And uh, that's definitely something that uh, I think is, is, is duly needed, is looking to different ways to deliver antimicrobials uh, and antibiotics to deal with our evolving uh, and heavily resistant uh, infections. So I got to say that, as, as, as we all know, as a lot of people have benefited from Trikafta over the past, uh, you know, however many years from, from, uh, from approval, I guess, wow, we're coming on two years now, uh, my life has been unlocked. Right. I uh, had a massive come around, uh, turnaround from uh, requiring uh, intervention every other month. Right. I probably dropped 30 to 40 percent of my treatment load. Uh, I really have no need to, uh, to, to dedicate nearly as much time as I once did <clears throat> to my health. And it allowed me to think about what do I want with the rest of my life? It made me think about how can I reinvent myself? Grad school is a was a very uh, natural choice. But of course, you know, what about family building, right? What about the other parts of life that aren't necessarily touching our career? And that's where I met Darcy. And Darcy uh, has been by my side. She is, uh, she has loved my life. And we got married uh, this past June and uh, where we, where we let everyone know at our wedding uh, as a big secret, a big reveal that Darcy and I had been going through IVF treatments uh, for quite some time now, you know, she, uh, she also lives, uh, with an autoimmune disorder uh, and some other underlying health conditions. So as we started, you know, getting closer and, and dating for a longer and longer period of time, the idea of family building came up and it came up pretty often, um, to the point where, you know, we said, why don't we just get a consultation with, uh, with a, uh, a fertility specialist in New York city and we'll see what they say. Right. We'll see what they say, because frankly, I wasn't getting very much information from, uh, you know, uh, the website, from from the Web, the Internet uh, or from the cystic fibrosis clinic. You know, the only things that we kind of knew were anecdotes from other patients who had gone through family building. So we saw our uh, our the specialist in New York City for for a consultation. And she recommended that we get uh, get going quickly with uh, with our with our IVF. So this is before we were married. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, wow, I got to. I got to turn up the time on my, uh, my, my, uh, my, my plan to propose and then marry Darcy. Um, but, and then of course the pandemic sort of set in and complicated all of that, but, uh, we, we, we went through it. And the thing that frustrated us the most was that there was just a general lack of information about how we could prepare ourselves for the medical interventions required for IVF. Right. So, uh, as many of us may know that uh, in, in CF, uh, there are infertility for both men, there are infertility issues for both men and women living with CF, but especially for men, uh, we are born with a congenital absence of the vas deferens, meaning the sperm can't exit our body uh, the natural way. So we have to uh, go through a sperm extraction so that we can uh, move forward with, with IVF. But before you can even do that, there are a whole slew of tests that you have to get done. You know, Darcy had to be tested as a, whether or not she was a CF carrier, which presented its own challenges because there's, until you are trying to go through it, you know, you have to start thinking about, well, should we do the, you know, the, the standard genetic, genetic panel, the expanded one, the comprehensive one, and uh, our cystic fibrosis clinic wasn't much to help because you presumably people are diagnosed before they even step foot inside of a CF clinic or OBGYN wasn't super helpful, did not know what to do. And there we were kind of flying blind until we eventually talked to a, a friend of ours with CF and said, no, 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 you have to do this, this one specific test. It's a comprehensive uh, CF, CF gene panel that will test for every single gene that is known. And we did that. Darcy was not a carrier. So we were able to proceed with the IVF process um, from baseline testing for me, baseline testing for her. And then um, what I'm calling the search and rescue mission to my nuts where we uh, extracted the sperm. Uh, and I gotta tell you, 
Uh, I was terrified for that procedure. Uh, let this be a word of calm and reassurance that it wasn't that bad. Uh, I was able to hold a conversation with the doctor while he was doing it, which is weird in its own right. Turned out he was a, a college lacrosse player and I, there I was talking about college lacrosse while I was getting sperm retracted. Uh, but from there, we uh, went through the most challenging parts of IVF, which are uh, the parts that Darcy had to do and that all women have to do when they go through IVF, uh, from daily injections to medical uh, monitoring and frequent lab draws, and of course, the, the egg retrieval and then the embryo transfer. And every single part of it is like uh, anxiety provoking just because you don't know what's going to happen. There's like, there's almost no guarantee at any point of the process. So seeing her strength and courage go through has been my inspiration for the past several months. I know it's going to be my inspiration probably for the rest of my life, just because, you know, everything that I've gone through felt like it paled in comparison to the few months that Darcy had to go through with the IVF process. We were fortunate enough that an embryo did stick and we're now expecting uh, a baby boy coming in, uh, in December. And I think my few takeaways from the whole pro the IVF process are, are, are this. One, the cost is ridiculous, right? And it's now a personal goal and vendetta of mine to figure out how we can make it more affordable, affordable for people with cystic fibrosis, right? There has to be a financial support program for people going through IVF, especially uh, folks who are going through the comprehensive uh, IVF uh, process. So that, that is a goal of mine. And that's something that, uh, that I'm taking away uh, and taking away in stride because that's something that I want other people with CF to have an opportunity to do. Two, the lack of information is just mind boggling, right from the CF clinic all the way through uh, every other part of the health system. It's like you're going through a maze with a blindfold on because you just have no idea where to look or turn. I'm super fortunate because uh, Darcy is a, a licensed, uh, a licensed uh, uh, trauma psychotherapist. So she's familiar with reading medical literature, literature on, you know, behavior health. So she took those skills and went right into uh, the, I, the world of IVF medical literature, which is international, it's wide, it's broad, it's dense, it's general. And she, uh, it wouldn't be uh, too infrequent that I'd walk in to the bedroom before we were about to go to sleep. And there she was reading another journal, a, a journal article and, you know, some medical journal. So I, I have a great deal of respect for, uh, for people who are going through IVF, people who have gone through IVF, but it is a goal of mine to make it easier, more streamlined, and I'm hoping cystic fibrosis clinics are able to eventually catch up uh, with, with the IVF process. So finally, uh, I'm gonna sort of turn, and what am I watching for in the future of CF uh, before, we, before we'll move on to the Q&A uh, Q uh, session here is one, I wanna take our wins from the telehealth experiment of the last you know, year and a half uh, of the COVID pandemic and bring them into the standard of care. Right. Um, for me, I have found that telehealth is frustrating on one hand because you can't get a very clear picture of uh, what uh, CF care is. You know, CF is a progressive disease. And of course, any one wrong thing can set off a whole slew of other issues. So uh, we can't substitute telehealth for all care. But I think, especially as people are um, improving with their health and people are. Uh, are able to stabilize their improving health in this like, new generation of CF, uh, we have to incorporate those telehealth wins into the standard of care. Is it really worth it for people with CF to be going to a hospital, to a medical center, to a CF clinic four times a year when we can just call in, we can dial in? Um, I think that's one thing that I, uh, that I have a, a hope for in the future. Two, we just talked about it. Sexual and reproductive health needs to be a priority area with patients now living longer. That's critically important to me, and I hope that starts from a very early age. Uh, three, for the love of God, someone needs to make new antibiotics, right? I mean, full stop. That kind of thing is uh, frustrating me. Of course, there's uh, a lot at play more than you know, folks uh, for, than, uh, than companies just not wanting to go into antibiotics. There's market issues there that need to be resolved by our policymakers. And then finally, uh, it's something that I'm uh, very passionate about and, so, and it's why I joined the board of No Patient Left Behind. New CF drugs must go generic without undue delay upon their exclusivity cliff. And what that means is uh, drug makers just can't pursue a policy of rent-seeking behavior, right? They can make their profit before uh, you know, their patented exclusivity periods end. And that sort of harkens back to the Hatch-Waxman Act and the Orphan Drug uh, Act in, in, in the uh, you know, several decades ago, but they can't exploit that, right? We, uh, we have a very 
uh, there's a very fragile balance between our drug makers, the, our payers, patients, and policymakers. And that exclusivity cliff is there that ties it all together. And what I want to see uh, is that our drug makers really are beholden to that exclusivity cliff uh, and, and move forward into the uh, as we move forward into the, the next generation of CF care. So with that, I just want to say thanks again. Uh, I will open this up. I guess we're doing a little Q&A. And again, thanks to Siri and everyone at CFRI for, uh, for inviting me to talk this afternoon. And thank you, Gunnar. Wow, what a great presentation. And uh, yes, it is time for questions. And uh, Siri will moderate that. Hi there, Gunnar. Thank you so very much. I'm going to let people, if they want to screenshot your slide to get your contact info, and then I'll ask you to stop the share so we can see you. Yes, I will Gunner. stop the share. Here we go. Great. And if people didn't have time to get that information, we will definitely share it afterwards. So thank you. Thank you. And I just, we're all so happy for you and Darcy. It's just such fabulous news and what a gift uh, to, to everybody that you're sharing that journey. Um, and, you know, I, I guess that's territory, you know, well, that you've been in the public spotlight <laughs> right from the beginning. Um, and I guess that leads uh, to a question. You have you know, the privilege of celebrity, but also the burden, I'm sure, that you you never really did have a choice, as you said, about being um, the face of CF for many. Um, how would you guide other parents, especially in this day and age, about what they disclose and share about their child's CF? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. And something that I, I talk a lot about with, especially high schoolers with CF and their parents, um, when, they're, when they're going on to college and uh, you know, it's, it's important to think carefully and, and uh, thoroughly about the choice to talk openly about CF, right? If you're going through uh, an athletic recruiting process, if they're going through uh, scholarship processes or, or, or anything like that, there, there may be potential ramifications for disclosing CF as, you know, we all kind of hope that that isn't the case, but, you know, you hear too often that, uh, you know, sometimes being too open can have a, uh, a negative consequence. But on the other side, you know, you do hear stories about people going off to college and hiding their CF even from their roommates or from other people. And then because of that, I think that second scenario kind of scares me more. Um, I think it's important for, for parents uh, to talk openly with their kids about CF, to talk openly with their friends about CF. Uh, you know, I remember growing up and whenever I had a play date, you know, at five, six, seven, eight years old, my parents would, regardless of the time of the day, just start my treatments when my, when my friends came over to the house so that my friends could see what it was like to live with CF, right? There's one thing to be told about what it, what it means to live with CF. It's another thing entirely to actually see what it looks like. And uh, I think from, from that kind of perspective, that like micro level perspective, uh, it's critically important that uh, the, the support system builds around people with CF from a very, very early age. Uh, we had another question. Uh, do you have any concerns about your child or children? Maybe there are more, Gunnar. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, I can probably see there's only one right now. Um, I, uh, I don't have a fear about uh, there being uh, my, my child or my son having a one CF mutation. Um, you know, I think before we even began the IVF process, uh, you know, before we, you know, went with sperm extraction or, you know, the egg retrieval, the first kind of step is the genetic panel to see if Darcy has CF herself. As soon as we found that she does not, uh, we pursued no further genetic testing, right? We did not do genetic testing before the embryo was planted. We did not do genetic testing, uh, as soon as the embryo was sort of created in the Petri dish. Um, you know, I think we saw that, uh, because Darcy did not have a mutation that we had to worry about, we just sort of saw it as a green light to go forward. Um, and, uh, you know, we kind of, we kind of joke that we call him the big fat science baby because he's the, the byproduct of a lot of different acts of science, right? I, um, I'm only at this point because of Trikafta first, second, we were doing this in the middle of the pandemic. So I had to be vaccinated. She got a vaccine and then, and we went through all this IVF miracle, which is science into of itself. So we call him the big fat science boy uh, because he's a byproduct of uh, a, a lot of things going on in, in a lot of different labs all over the world. <laughs> that is amazing. Uh, let's see, there's a question. Um, as an adult beyond your, your poster child years, uh, can you say about uh, when you became so involved in the sea of community and how that impacted your own experience of the disease? 
You know, I think um, for me, I, I kind of always grew up around fundraisers. I always grew up around uh, CF events. Um, so it was just sort of ingrained in my life as if it would be something that I would always kind of do. Um, but the real reason I sort of got into like, the patient advocacy world is that uh, when I graduated college and my health was sort of in decline, I had to put off my dream of going to law school. So it's hard to believe that like I, the world needed another lawyer. Uh, but I uh, had this great big plan to go to law school. Uh, Darcy always pokes fun at me for my dream having been to be a litigator. Uh, it's not my dream anymore, <laughs> uh, but I needed something to do. So uh, I got involved uh, with the CF uh, scholarship program at BEF. That was like my first sort of job responsibility. Uh, and getting to talk to other people with CF on the phone during interviews and scholarship diligence and you know, you go through, you know, 45, 50 conversations with people with CF really quickly. Um, and you get to meet and talk to a lot of great people out there living with CF who have made their CF well-known, people who are, aren't are very open about their CF for, for a number of different reasons. And you get to hear about what they're going through and then you relate it to your own experience. Uh, and I was just hooked immediately. So from there, you know, responsibility started to tack on, tack on, tack on. Um, and it, for me, it's just, it's, it's part of my life really. We have a question about your sister. Can you talk about life with a sister? What yeah, so my sister, Sydney, uh, she does not have CF. She's actually not even a carrier for the CF gene. Um, she and I grew up like best friends. Um, I, I often kind of tell the story uh, about the time that I went to a party as a seventh grader. I played spin the bottles. First time I you know, kissed a girl kind of thing. And my sister was right there. Uh, when I got home from the party, wanting to know everything, of course, spreading rumors about her older brother uh, and, uh, and of course, trying to figure out who she needs to talk to because they may have mistreated me. But I think that's sort of kind of like a microcosm of our relationship. Um, she, uh, she has been my biggest fan and she has been my biggest supporter and protector for my entire life. And uh, the reason, you know, it's similar to reasons that I described earlier about how my parents, um, you know, always had my friends over when I would, uh, when I always had me do treatments, when I had my friends over, when I didn't have friends over, my CF treatments were like a social time in the house, right? From a very early age, uh, the rule was that I couldn't do my treatments alone, right? So, and the reason I couldn't do my treatments alone is because I couldn't believe that they were taking me away from something that was going on inside the house. Um, and so my treatments were always set up in a communal area, like a TV room or the kitchen or like the room off the kitchen, uh, and whether my mom would sit with me, my dad would sit me with, with me, or my sister would sit with me, um, would kind of be like a rotating carousel. But it's we got a lot of great family time that way, right? It's, it's extra time that my parents built in that I could spend with my sister every single day. And we loved it. I mean, to this day, um, I keep my treatments in a very communal room. I've never done them in my bedroom, even in college, um, which is, of course, presents its own challenges in college when people see what you're doing. Uh, but I, uh, I, I think my parents... Uh, had a had a great parenting trick, and it was to make my sister and I just love each other so much that we felt like we always had to be with each other. In college, didn't you have somebody see you use your nebulizer for the first time and finally got the courage to ask for a hit? <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly what happened. We uh, the first time I uh, the first time I did my treatments in college. Uh, my, uh, my buddy, who's like still one of my best friends today, kind of looked at me with a, like a strange face and was like, are you going to pass that or, or, or what? And thinking, of course, that it was like a vaporizer or marijuana or some, something. And I was like, that's not, that's not what this is. And then, of course, there I am explaining what cystic fibrosis is to, you know, 15 new faces. And I think just because I was so open with my college friends, like they're all still my best friends today. And um, it, to me, that's like, I feel very fortunate to have such a great group of friends. Just not having the burden of masking it or hiding it. Yeah. Um, there's a question. How did you learn about the prognosis of CF? And at what age would you tell a child with CF, uh, if at all? CF has changed, you know, CF has changed over time. But yeah. When you know, I think um, I, I have a lot of feelings about the, uh, the life expectancy stat, the median age of death stat. Um, for me, I think I became numb to it very early on because a lot of times those statistics are used as like fundraising and uh, markers of success with fundraising. Um, so, you know, I, 
it never like occurred to me. My parents never sat me down and were like, you know, Gunner, you're going to live to 25 years old. You know, uh, that was never like a conversation. You know, I don't ever remember having a doctor t- talk to me about that kind of thing. Uh, the only thing my, my parents will say about, you know, those days and it's the story that I've heard over and over again is that when I was diagnosed, you know, Pulmazine had just been approved. Um, and uh, a doctor came out and said, you know, there's drugs on the way. That was back when we thought, you know, the gene therapy thing was going to work out. Um, and, you know, they had, uh, they, they told my parents, you know, Gunner's going to go to college one day. That, that is something that we can tell you with some degree of certainty will, will come true. And of course I went to college. Um, and then as soon as I started living past that, I felt like it was, it was free time. Um, but uh, to answer the question, I, I do think that um, it's important for parents to probably talk about it before they hear it at a fundraiser and without context, right? I think I just kept hearing it over and over again that I made my own conclusions. Um, and I also do think that kids are smart these days, right? They know how to use the internet, they know how to Google search, and they will find it whether or not you tell them. So uh, I think it's important to have that conversation, but not not in a fearful way, right? Like the the prognosis for CF is changing, and it, frankly, it's it's quite good now. Something that's come up kind of frequently as a, a topic in many of the presentations and in the chat box is about medical trauma. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think of when CFRI did that externally led patient focused drug development meeting and you were one of the participants and we were you know, talking through what was to be shared before it. And you said, oh, you know, I had pancreatitis like five times. <laughs> and I was like, Irk, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, tell us about pancreatitis, because from all I've heard, it is sheer hell. And it just made me think about how much is internalized by people with CF that just uh, daily, um, that becomes almost minimized, almost by necessity. And yet it is there as medical trauma. So uh, I just want to plant the seed that I feel like between CFRI and, and the Rumor Science Foundation, we should be talking about strategies for addressing medical trauma in our community. Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a big problem. Um, you know, I of course told the story where I ran away from the interventional radiology suite as a child. Um, but the truth is I was terrified of getting IVs or pick lines or whatever until probably college. You know, I, I remember any time that it was broached, the subject was brought up that, you know, a pick line might be in my future. You know, I was like on the verge of tears. Right. And this is like through high school. Um, you know, as, as like, you know, a, a, a budding adult um, to the point where like no one had ever like asked me how I felt about it. Right. It was always just kind of prescribed. And the reason I you know think back on so many influential you know medical moments is for things like that. Right. It's like things that I pushed through, things that I've gotten through. Um, but the truth is, you know, as, as I've gotten older and especially when I was going through my hard years right after college, before uh, I entered the track after program, uh, you know, I've had, I had a number of conversations with my doctor about, okay, you know, the antibiotics are starting to fail, right? And as soon as you hear that for the first time, as soon as you, you know, see that, see and hear that a drug that you've relied on or many drugs that you've relied on for your entire life are starting to fail, like that is a gut-wrenching moment as well. Um, and I think, you know, I, I don't want to put this on the CF care providers because they're conveying information, but, you know, when you see a doctor and then you have a conversation like that, like I'm bringing 20 years of experience of having these like terrible uh, moments uh, into the clinic with me. And, and I do think that you're right that I think it's like just an, an under uh, appreciated issue. Uh, and I am hopeful that uh, moving forward, uh, you know, as, as prognosis increases and, you know, therapeutics are, aren't necessarily the only priority, you know, we can start thinking about the entire patient that is sitting and present in the clinic. That is a great way to end the, the Q&A session. I'm getting the sign that I'm to throw this back uh, to Jim McGunner. Unbelievable presentation. We are all so grateful to you and grateful to Darcy because you're sharing her story too. And we're just grateful we get to follow along with this exciting journey you're on now. Yeah, thanks, Siri. I really appreciate it. And yeah, you're right. Darcy is the, uh, the real brains behind the operation in our house. That is, that is one thing I'm absolutely certain of. Yes, thank you, Gunnar. That was awesome. Well, hard to believe, but we're getting to the end of the program. And if you're like me, your head's about ready to explode from all this information we've taken in over the weekend. So I do want to thank you for the honor of being your MC for the weekend. And uh, I also want to thank Jerry, Melanie, and our tech crew behind the scenes. They have just done such a great job. Uh, I mean, to pull something like this off virtually is mind numbing. And uh, they, they, overall did a great job. And so with that, 
I am going to pass the microphone back to Siri because she's got some things to give away and there's, there's still a couple of things going on, right, Siri? There, I've been sneaking back and forth to look at the leaderboard. Um, unbelievably, we have a tie for the first and second place. So um, I think really the only fair way to do that is that we will combine the gift cards divide by two for our one and two. So uh, hang on, I have to tilt my screen to find the names. Maggie Williamson and Linda Bowman, you, can, you have tied for the birth. And Krista Icing, Icing, you are in third place. So those are locked in and we will touch base with all of you so that we can get you uh, either the Amazon or the Etsy gift cards that you have won. And I'm really grateful to everybody who participated in that um, so that we could, well, it just made it more fun, A, and B, we just love encouraging that people really took the time to go through and visit with our sponsors and our exhibitors and you know, look at the CFAN booths and Roxia Foundation booths. So thank you all. So uh, unbelievably, after planning for a year, it seems crazy that the conference is coming to a close. Um, this has just been an incredible event for me. I hope it has been for you. Um, and it's made all the more significant in light of the, the tragedies of the pandemic. And planning this conference was a grand adventure. All of us at CFRI sought to create a virtual environment that would still engender community and connection. And we so hope you experience this. We are greatly indebted to the phenomenal speakers, volunteers, exhibitors, sponsors who participated this weekend as an act of service to our CF community. Thank you for sharing your valuable time and your expertise. And if we could all hear each other, that's the one hard thing about this, not hearing the sound of everybody's here, I'm sure you would all hear raucous cheers and receive a standing ovation. There are no words. But the other people I wanna thank here are the you, the attendees. Um, the chat box this weekend, it's been incredible. Your comments, shared experiences, questions, uh, taught me so much. And they also provided guidance on ways CFRI can better support you. Shout out to Gabriella for her continued advocacy to always have high quality captioning. And the chat box also suggested CFRI sponsored ASL classes and other ideas. And I do admit the um, regular Zoom dance party was my, my hope. <laughs> I've said it before, but we CFRI does aim to be responsive to community needs, and we can only do this with your input. So thank you so much. As you know, this conference has attendees from around the globe, which means we are straddling countless time zones. For those of you who missed some of the presentations because they fell at three o'clock in the morning your time, the good news is that you can log back into the conference platform using your same login information for the next 30 days uh, to catch up on anything you missed. And then after 30 days, all that content um, will be released on CFRI's YouTube channel and Podbean channel. And as I said earlier, we will be um, adding subtitles in Hindi and Spanish to much of that content. Um, a reminder to everyone that at two o'clock Pacific, five o'clock Eastern, we'll be holding support and discussion groups. We have an amazing selection of eight different groups. If you haven't been in the lounge yet and looked at the list, please do. Um, my warm thanks to all the facilitators. They are volunteering their time today to lead these groups. And so again, you can go to the lounge, click on them, you'll see the topic. You can choose your group, you will enter that room. So on behalf of everyone at CFRI, I thank you all for being a part of this extraordinary community. I hope the conference provided new information, valuable resources, and a renewed sense of community that continues to, excuse me, continues to sustain you through these extraordinarily challenging days into the future. Members of the conference committee are looking forward to planning our 2022 conference. It's gonna require creativity to achieve our goal to blend, if possible, COVID permitting, the in-person experience with a virtual experience that's as engaging as this one. We hear you loud and clear. A quality virtual experience is here to stay. I am honored to share the CF journey with you all. Together in partnership, we'll continue to support those living with the disease while never, never retreating from our mission in search to find a cure. 
I hope that you and yours are safe and well. We hope to see you virtually or in person next year at our 35th, 35th annual conference. Thank you all so much.